Yeah, good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to our today's lecture on Game AI. Today we are going to you know, deal with a very heavy menu. Uh, first of all, as always, we will recap what we did last time and then our main topic for today is going to be Monte Carlo Tree Search. In order to appreciate what I'll be telling you about Monte Carlo Tree Search, First, however, we should look into the notion of Monte Carlo methods uh, in general or what, where these, these methods come from. And then, to fully understand the power of Monte Carlo methods, we also have to look into the notion of the exploration, exploitation dilemma and what to do about it. And I know that each of these three topics would basically merit a lecture on its own so I'm squeezing a lot of material into today's lecture, uh, but let's see. Let's see how far we can take it from here. So, uh, what have we done last time? If you remember, or last couple of times, we have been looking into the idea of problem solving by means of search tree expansion. And um, we looked into a couple of algorithms sort of naive algorithms or kind of mechanical algorithms to expand search trees and also studied some of their characteristics. Right? And uh, for instance, we studied the idea of depth-first search and found that we can express the worst case computational complexity of this algorithm or this family of algorithms in terms of uh, the order B, average branching factor of the tree, raised to the power of m, where m is indicating the deepest level of the search tree. Right? And exponential expressions like these grow fairly quickly, and so we can basically conclude that uh, for all intents and purposes, depth-first tree searches are not really suitable for practical applications. They are too time-intensive. We also studied the idea of breadth-first expansion of uh, a search tree. Here we found that we can express the worst-case complexity in terms of uh, big O of B, again, average branching factor, raised to the power of D plus 1, where we said D is the shallowest level on the search tree where we can find a solution. Um, this does not grow quite as quickly as uh, B raised to the power of M because D is typically much less than M. But still, uh, this idea also suffers from drawbacks, in particular in contrast to depth-first tree search. Breadth-first tree search has to store, keep in memory, all the tree nodes that are being expanded or considered for examination. And again, we can conclude that this Again, somewhat naive idea of tree exploration is not feasible pro practical applications. It's too memory intensive. Well, you know, we also looked into ways of dealing with these problems. And one of the classical ideas, uh, in particular, in the area of AI, whenever tree search is considered as an approach to problem solving, um, is to consider the notion of alpha-beta pruning. This we also studied in detail and we found that it's a variant of a depth-first search algorithm. So basically the complexity will still be somewhat of the order of B raised to the power of M. However, now there is a constant which has the beautiful property that it is less or equal than 1. Uh, typically it's larger than 1 over 2. But therefore, if, if all you know, goes really well, we can use alpha-beta pruning to push down the complexity of depth-first searches to o, uh, o of b raised to 1 over 2 times m, which is considerably less than uh, b raised to the power of m. And still, this is not cheap enough for many, many, many practical applications. Basically, it depends on um, the order in which we expand uh, tree nodes on the fringe, which is the set of those tree nodes which we have not examined yet. And we saw that death uh, can, can be very efficient, but it may also go wrong depending on, on this ordering criteria. 
course, we also talked about um, evaluation functions, which we might use to assess the quality of a search node for future expansion. And uh, we discussed that that may help us like ordering nodes uh, ranked according to quality so that we might expand those search tree nodes first that are more auspicious than others, others in the fringe. Right? But in particular, we can use these evaluation functions also to restrict the depth of the look ahead. That is, to restrict the number of levels these tree search algorithms will have to explore. And then, depending on how we choose this depth of the look ahead, say some lambda, we can basically push the complexity down to um, B raised to the lambda, where lambda is some, some small number. However, this requires to define evaluation functions. Right? And we discussed that, you know, from a very abstract point of view, we can assume there is such an evaluation function and then take it from there discuss all the theoretical properties of these algorithms under the assumption that there is such an evaluation function. However, defining these evaluation function is more an art or a craft than a science. It's very difficult or, uh, may I say, impossible to you know, come up with a general definition of what is a good evaluation function. They always have to be chosen according to the problem at hand. So there has to be a lot of human ingenuity going into the design of proper and useful evaluation functions. Well, so to conclude, I mean, uh, these things are either very expensive and not really feasible, or if they are, uh, you know, feasible, then they raise the problem of having to define functions where nobody really knows how to do it, and you have to be an expert for the problem you're dealing with in order to do that. This is somewhat of a downer. And so therefore, today we will look into the latest idea as to how to deal with these kind of problems. Problem solving as tree search. And that will lead us to the idea of Monte Carlo tree search, which has, believe it or not, a complexity of O of M, where M is the deepest level of the tree. This sounds really good, but what does it really mean to talk about complexities or efforts using this big O notation? I have been doing that for the last couple of lectures without actually ever you know, explaining what this means. And of course, I hope that you all know this, but here is a refresher. We say that a function f of x, we just assume that this function basically depends on one variable and that variable sort of indicates the, the size of the problem we are dealing with. We say that a function f of x is in the complexity class big O of g of x if there exists an x naught, some, some threshold, say, so that for every x larger than this x0, the norm of the function f of x we are interested in is less or equal than a constant c times the norm of g of x. So consider, for instance, uh, two functions, uh, say 2 times x and x squared. And let's consider their behavior uh, for all positive real numbers, so we exclude zero and everything that is negative, then you'll find that um, for the interval, the open interval between zero and two, uh, two of x, the linear function, you know, grows linear in x, and actually for that interval it does so faster than x squared. But once we have reached a value of two, so x naught would be uh, larger than 2, the square grows faster than the linear function. Right? So for this simple example, that uh, cutoff or that, that threshold value would be 2. Every, for, for every x larger than 2, the square grows faster than 2 times x. Um, and 
with that in mind, now can you tell me the complexity class of this polynomial? So we have a, a third order polynomial, like a constant, some constant times uh, x, another constant times x squared, and some constant times x cubed. What is the complexity class of this polynomial? x to the power of 3. Exactly. exactly. Uh, because we can find an x0 and a c such that for every x larger than this x0, uh, there will be a c or some c such that if we multiply c with you know, the, the norm of x to the 3, this will grow faster than this polynomial. The norm of this point. And here is a warning. Um, this C may be large. Uh, this is why, why I'm pointing this out so much. Because I said this technique we are going to study today has a complexity of O of M, but that does not necessarily mean that it's really fast. <laughs> because we may need a very large C to actually use it to its full potential. All right, now then let's dive into our, our main topic for the day. And we will begin by looking at the notion of Monte Carlo methods. Uh, this is a very general concept and it typically refers to the use of stochastic techniques and that is to say that it refers to the use of techniques or algorithms that involve an element of chance or that may resort to probability theory in order to solve a problem. Uh, looking it up at Wolfram Math World, we find this quote, the Monte Carlo method is any method which solves a problem by generating suitable random numbers and observing that fraction of the numbers obeying some property or properties. End quote. And we find this at this web address, wolfram.com. Before we continue, I have to talk about this. What did I do here? This is now a meta discussion. This is a meta discussion. I have quoted something in a scientifically correct way. And I'm pointing that out because for those of you who are going to write the reports at the end of the semester, I, I always point out that uh, copying text from the internet is not acceptable unless you quote it properly. In the last semester, we had a couple of cases where they did copy text from the internet or other resources and therefore, unfortunately, failed. Then they told me well, we never learned how to quote properly, which I considered surprising since, you know, you're all at least bachelors, so you would have had to write a bachelor thesis. Should have looked into that. Now there's no excuse anymore. This is how you quote properly, right? You introduce whatever you copy using quotation marks and you point out actively that this is not your own thought but found somewhere else. So he said, as blah 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 discusses or as we find at blah or according to whatever, I introduce where this quote comes from and then I actually list the source. Right? If you do it like that, then you're fine. If you don't do it like that, it is cheating, right? So no excuses anymore. And this is what I wanted to do with this slide. But it's also such a beautiful quote. Any method which solves the problem by generating suitable random numbers and observing that fraction of the numbers obeying some property or properties. This is indeed what the Monte Carlo method does. All right, where are these things used? And they have a venerable history they actually were developed when the first computers became available in the 1940s. Typically, one resorts to Monte Carlo methods whenever we're dealing with uh, numerical problems, you know, where there is no analytical solution or where it is impossible to come up with an analytical solution so that we could you know, basically deal with the problem using pen and paper whenever we cannot Monte Carlo methods are a good idea or a good last resort. Um, this is very typically used in the context of simulations, in particular uh, 
the dynamics of very complex systems, for instance, in the realm of uh, weather forecasting. And it plays a crucial role um, you know, if you look into what, what you know, is it what makes these simulations so difficult. It has basically to do with solving integrals or systems of differential equations. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, this can be extremely difficult. And then in order to use Monte Carlo methods to address these kind of problems, there are basically four things you need. You need to define your problem, you need to know what you are dealing with. So we have to sort of define the domain we are dealing with and possible inputs to the problem. Uh, random numbers play a crucial role in Monte Carlo methods. So we have to have some mechanism that generates random numbers or samples from uh, statistical distributions. And then we need to know, once we are given a number or several numbers, what actually to do with these numbers. That is, there has to be a way of computing with these random inputs. And finally, fourth of all, you need to be able to aggregate the results over several random trials and deduce something therefrom. And this is, of course, very abstract, so let's look into an example. And the example I will consider today is the computation of the Hellinger distance between two Weibull distributions. And uh, in order to compute this Hellinger distance, we have to integrate. And I'll show you how to use Monte Carlo methods in order to integrate something. And Monte Carlo integration is also called hit or miss integration. All right, so this will be the first major topic today. And uh, we will approach it by first remembering what we know about distances and then we shall look into the definition of the Hellinger distance between statistical distributions and we will also familiarize ourselves with the Weibull distribution. Once we are done with that we can actually compute these Monte Carlo integrals. A distance is a function, let's call it d, and it takes as input uh, two elements from some set S and maps them to R plus where I use R plus to define all real numbers greater or equal than zero. So zero is included in R plus here. So let's look at it. Uh, let's assume there were three objects or elements in that set S, whatever it is. Could be numbers, could be vectors, could be apples, could be oranges, we don't care. We have a set and we have three elements out of that set. Right? The first property of this function d, the distance, is that the distance between two objects, x and y, is always greater or equal than zero. Right? This is basically the definition. And the first property is that this distance, if it is zero, that implies that x is equal to y. The first, uh, second property we require from a function d to be called a distance is that it has to be symmetric. And that is to say that the order of the two arguments, x and y, does not matter. In other words, d of x and y is supposed to be the same as d of y and x. There are many, many functions that do have these properties. The third one is crucial. This one is called the triangle inequality. And it basically says, if we consider three objects, x, y, and z, and we look at the distance between x and that, z, then this distance has to be less or equal than the distance between x and a third number y, plus the distance between that object y and z. This is indeed basically what really makes a distance. These two properties are met by many, many, many other functions. This property is somewhat exclusive for distances. Right? So you always, like, if you are faced with computing distances and you come up with your own measure, you have to actually check that this one is given by the measure you are looking at. And here is the notion of the Hellinger distance. 
And now I'm specifying this set S. I say the set S, see, like we again take two elements of some arbitrary set S, uh, somehow do something with these two elements, and this doing something with two elements leads to a real number greater or equal than zero. Uh, and now we look at a distance where the set S is given by the collection, the set of all probability density functions over the real numbers. All right. So the x, y, and z from the previous slide will now be functions defined over the real numbers that meet the properties of a probability density. In particular, the Hellinger distance is defined, we can actually simplify our lives by looking at the squared Hellinger distance. So the squared Hellinger distance between two probability densities, F1 and F2, is 1 over 2 times the integral of the square root of F1 minus the square root of F2. This difference has to be squared, and we have to integrate over all real numbers dt in this case. Now if we were to expand uh, this square we would, would get an expression with three integrals uh, since we are talking about probability densities here. The square of the square root of a probability density is just the probability density and the integral over such a probability density is always one. So we can indeed simplify this definition to this expression. That is, the square Hellinger distance between two probability densities defined over the real numbers is 1 minus the integral of the square root of f1 of t times f2 of t dt. This is the square Hellinger distance which we will look into right now. Interestingly, uh, this is a nice feature of, of these distances that indeed whatever comes out of this equation is a value between 0 and 1, just, uh, just as a side note. Finally, the Weibull distribution. Uh, that is an example of such a probability density function. And it is defined uh, not for the whole real number line, but just for all real numbers greater or equal than 0, but that does not matter. Uh, we can define it for the whole real number line by setting everything less than 0 to 0. So no problem here. Here is how it is defined. The probability density function of the Weibull, well, depends on the parameter t we're interested in, a real number, and uh, variable t, and two parameters, say k and lambda. And it is given as k over lambda times t over lambda raised to the power of k minus 1 times e to the minus t over lambda raised to the power of k. That is the probability density of the Weibull function. And well, if we integrate that, we get the cumulative density function, which is 1 minus e to the minus t over lambda raised to the power of k. And of course, if we differentiate that, we get the probability density function. And so yeah, there we go. Uh, these two numbers or parameters, k and lambda, are supposed to be greater than zero. Otherwise, uh, say if the lambda was uh, less than zero, we would have a problem here. Or, or would be zero, we'd have a problem there. So we you know, just look at k's and lambda's greater than zero. And they are set to define the shape and scale of the Weibull distribution. What do I mean by that? Well, let's first of all, uh, I'm ahead of myself here, but so, okay. Once again, um, we are looking at the Weibull distribution. And for those of you not quite so happy with the notion of probability density functions and cumulative density functions, let us remind ourselves what that means. So, this blue curve here, is the probability density function of the Weibull distribution for some choice of k and lambda. And uh, given some t, the point on this curve, f of t, lowercase f of t, that is the value of the PDF at t. And the 
cumulative density function, capital F of t at this point, is the area under the curve between 0 and that t. This is the cumulative density and this is the probability density function of the Weibull. And uh, just to point out the effect of different uh, shape parameters, I've fixed the scale parameter, I guess, to 6 in this example. But if we look at the definition of the Weibull density, once again, k over lambda times t over lambda raised to the power of k minus 1 times e to the minus t over lambda raised to the power of k, depending on how we choose k, we end up with a fairly large spectrum of possible shapes of this function. All right? uh, in particular, if we choose k equal to 1, the Weibull distribution will always coincide with an exponential. So the exponential distribution is a special case of the Weibull. And then um, uh, for growing values of k, actually for k about 3.5, the Weibull distribution is very, very close to the normal distribution. It contains other interesting functions as well. So this, this is a very interesting probability density. And why would I actually talk about this one in this lecture on gamma? Anybody any idea? Why, why the Weibull? OK. Uh, <laughs> so why the Weibull? Uh, it turns out that if you analyze data uh, gathered uh, about playing times, of players, uh, you'll find the Weibull. Uh, in the experiments, uh, in the study we published in 2012, we found that, and we had data provided by uh, companies in the, in the gaming industry as to how many hours per day people played uh, a game they just purchased. Uh, you can track these numbers if you play online, you know, when the players log into a server and whatnot. So this, these numbers can be tracked. It turns out, that daily playing times players devote uh, to a newly uh, bought game are indeed viable distributed. So basically that is to say, I don't know, uh, at the first day whatever player plays so much, the third day so much, fifth day so much, you know, typically it rises for a couple of days. The first day people don't play that much, then they play more, then, they play more. then it reaches a peak. And from that peak onward, playing times per day decrease. And the Weibull does a perfect job, a perfect job to describe these statistics. And therefore, indeed, the Weibull distribution yeah, is of interest in the context of gaming. So there you have it. And then where is the problem? Okay, now we know that um, playing times per day are Weibull distributed. We can observe the data for a player A or player 1 and a player 2 and uh, describe their behavior using these Weibull distributions. And then we could ask the question, so uh, are these two players similar in their behavior in playing whatever game we're looking at? basically the problem of having to compare two viable distributions. Right? If we can do that and we have uh, fitted viable distributions to the playtime data of thousands of players, we can use whatever comparison we agreed on to cluster these players into, say, the people who uh, play a lot at the very beginning and then you know, cease to play and another cluster might be the people who have sort of a slow start and then reach peak activity and then uh, it takes quite some time until they lose interest in the game. Whatever. We could use comparisons between viable distributions to cluster players according to their playtime behavior. And of course, uh, comparison you know, evokes the idea of computing a distance. Right? If we have the distance between two viable distributions, we can call two players more similar if their distance, corresponding distance, is small. Or we could call them you know, rather different with respect to their behavior if the distance between the two respective viable distributions is large. But where is the problem? We have 
are already looked into the notion of the Hellinger distance between probability distributions. So let's just compute it. All right, and here it is. We just have to compute min uh, 1 minus the integral from 0 to infinity. Y1 is defined for anything larger than 0. Uh, times the first PDF, square root of that. So we have to consider the power uh, of 1 half um, times the second PDF raised to the power of 1 half square root. Really? Uh, no problem at all. But we look at this integral and pull out every constant term, some c, we can pull that out, and we don't really worry, like the problem is computing the integral, not min min minus the integral, so like the problem is the integral, right? So let's look at the integral, we pull out all the constant terms, and we end up with this, uh, integral from 0 to infinity, t raised to the uh, 1 over 2, k1 plus k2, and then e to the minus one half, and then t over lambda one raised to k one plus t over lambda two raised to k two. Where is the problem? Infinity. Uh, no. And continuously, we can uh, somehow uh, consider it as a discrete case and some. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Are you already answering uh, the the? Uh, are you already presenting the solution to the problem we are facing? <laughs> so, uh, the problem is that this integral cannot be evaluated analytically. It does not exist. Does anybody know why not? So, this, this function here times this does not have an antiderivative. Is that, is that, have you seen that before? Well, it happens all the time. And the problem here is that uh, basically the argument of the exponential we cannot, we cannot, unless k1 equals k2, then this becomes very trivial actually. But unless this is not the case, this integral cannot be solved using pen and paper. It does not exist. But we can look at the three. Uh, say curve. So let's say the green one here is the first variable distribution, the playtime behavior of the first player, and the red one is the second variable distribution, the playtime behavior of the second player. And then we can, of course, compute f1 times f2 and the square root of that, and we can plot it here. This is the black curve. Right? I mean, we can definitely compute this function. We cannot integrate it. Well, we can compute it. It's funny, but it's true. Right? And for this example, we are thus dealing with the problem. If we want to compare the red and the green curve, basically, we need to compute the area under the black curve. Right? Because this area features prominently in the Hellinger distance. So if we can compute this area, we can compute the distance between the red and the green curve. And to simplify our lives, um, we basically, in this example that is to follow, look at computing the area under the black curve from 0 to 7. And basically, indeed, we would have to compute the area between under the curve from 0 out to infinity, but for all practical purposes, we can say that at the value of 7, the black curve has basically already reached 0. Right? And I've chosen 7 here just for the purpose of plotting. So, very careful with what is to come now, but this is just to simplify my life when I was generating these plots. Again, our problem is that we want to compute the area under the black curve between 0 and 7. There you go. It's called A. Now, fine, yeah. Um, you said for calculating area, yeah. we are using Hellinger distance. Oh, no, no, no. We calculate the area to compute the Hellinger distance. Okay, then what, what does the distance do? The distance function? Okay, so once again, uh, if we are given 
two viable distributions and we want to compare them. We could say that, oh, let's use the Hellinger distance. Let's compute the distance between these two density functions, right? Uh, F1 and F2. And that is basically to say, if we want to compute the squared distance here, it's mathematically more tractable, but once we have that, we can compute the square root. So no problem there. The squared Hellinger distance between two distributions, and they are viable distributions in our case, is given as one minus this integral. So in order to compute the squared distance, we have to evaluate the integral. But if we can do that, we have the distance. But of course, this integral here basically denotes the area under the black curve. Right? And, and there's the problem here. If the black curve, it looks very vibrantly, like compared to the other examples I've shown you earlier, it, it looks very much like a vibrant system. But we already know that the area has to be less than 1, less or equal than 1. Right? Because if the black curve was a probability density function, then the area beneath the black curve would be 1. This is property of probability density functions. Uh, so as it is related to the distance between two probability functions, it must be something less than 1. So this black curve is not a probability density function. It is something uh, that can be easily computed, the black curve. But the area under that curve, this expression here, this one, cannot be computed analytically. And so we have to resort to numeric methods or to simulations. Right? And uh, in this lecture today, we resort to simulations because this is what this lecture is all about. Now let's look at the idea of Monte Carlo integration. And here is uh, how that works. We want to integrate a function, uh, which is the square root of one y times the other. And um, so in order for this to work, uh, this function, the domain of the function has to be bounded. Right? So we have to have some uh, lower limit and some upper limit. 0 and, in our case, 7. That was not the case. I mean, we can make this very large, but on a digital computer, we still would have proper problems if we were to sort of integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. I think it's very difficult. So let's bound the interval we are talking about when computing the area. Right? And I once again bound it from 0 to 7, and that was a choice I made. There is no reason for that choice other than it leads to beautiful plots. The variable of integration has to be bounded from below and from above. And on that bounded interval, or with that bounded interval, we now define a rectangle. So um, that is along the x-axis we have a length of 7. So the x value of this within this rectangle is bounded by a and b, which are the boundaries of integration we are looking at. And at the same time, we demand that the height of this rectangle is also bounded. And since we are talking about probability densities here, I chose the height to be 1. It's a very safe choice in many cases. Lots of these left curves will never exceed uh, this upper y bound of 1. The take-home message is we define some rectangle and let's call it capital Omega. Right? And again, how you do it is more an art than a science. It depends on your application. But we have that. And then we define a pair X and Y in this rectangle Omega to be a uniform random vector. And I show you some of them. Every dot here is one such vector. Right. And, you know, I use the random number generator to generate random points inside this rectangle. And they are, in this example, chosen according to a uniform distribution. That is to say, there is no preference 
for certain areas within this rectangle, if I'm generating a random point inside the rectangle, every point is equally likely. And we can use these points to estimate the area under the curve. This is what we are aiming at. Basically, um, we can say that the probability for one such random point to lie beneath the black curve is given as the ratio of the area under the curve divided by the area of the rectangle. Do you see that? All right. We have a bounded rectangle and inside that bounded rectangle we have some, you know, sub-area, the area under the black curve. And the probability for a point, if we randomly pick a point inside that rectangle, the probability for that point to lie inside uh, this area here is basically the size of this area divided by the size of the whole rectangle. This is this frequentist interpretation of probability. It is a ratio. But this integral, the area under the curve, we called it A, is what we do want to compute. So, how do we do that then? Because right? like basically uh, we can compute this problem if we knew this area. Well, we don't know that area. This is actually what we want to find. And here is what we do. We define uh, or generate a random sample of points, as I'm showing you here. I guess this is 100 points. And we define an indicator function. An indicator function. That is a function, uh, depending on two parameters, x and y. We're talking about a two-dimensional example here. And the value of h of x and y is 1 if the y coordinate of whatever point we consider is below the uh, value of this function f at the corresponding point x. So for this point here, the y coordinate of this point is above f of the x coordinate. But for this point here, the y-coordinate is below f of the x-coordinate. Right? If it is above, we set it to 0, this indicator function. If it is below, we set it to 1. So this is a filter. After we have applied this function to every point we generated, it has filtered out those points below the curve. For the other points, it returns a value of 0. But then we can compute the number of points that are below uh, the black curve. Let's call it an H. H for hit. The number of hits. That is, in this example, the points that actually ended up below the curve are called a hit. And this is nothing but the sum over the corresponding indicator values. Right? Because if it is below, then this will give a 1. If it is above, it will give a 0. So the number of points below the black curve is nothing but the number of 1s returned by the indicator function. But then we can indeed compute this ratio. Right? Because now we have filtered out the number of points we generated below the curve. And we know how many points we generated in total. And so we can say the probability for a point ending up below the curve is nh over n, where n is the total number of points. But once we have this value p, we can solve this previous equation, this one, for a. All right? And then, if we do this, we have a way of computing the area under the curve. And this crucially depends on randomly generating points. This is the Monte Carlo, the random process here. Okay, let's see how well this works. Uh, and for didactic reasons, um, sort of to estimate the true value of this area under the curve, I used numerical integration first. Right? And of course, um, 
if you are if you are familiar with numerical computation, you know that solving simple integrals like this using numerical methods is no problem at all. Actually, there are lots of um, numerical solvers built into SciPy. I encourage you to, to use those. If I use one of them uh, called Quad, we find that the area below this black curve is about 0.868. Now let's see how Monte Carlo does. If um, we do this with the 100 points we considered so far, you know, now I'm coloring the ones below the curve in blue and above the curve in orange, compute the ratio, use this probability to solve for A, we find that the area is about 0.56, which is of course a bit of an underestimate. Right? So what if we increase the number of random samples, say to 1000, uh, now all of a sudden it is 0.875, this time it's an overestimate. Uh, let's continue, uh, this time with 10,000 points, now it's 0.888, which is still a bit overestimated, but you know. And I indeed also did it with 100,000 points, and now we find uh, 0.863, which is sort of close enough. Right. It works. It works. Now we have seen <coughs> how to use random processes, Monte Carlo processes, to solve an analytically intractable problem. We cannot solve this integral using pen and paper, but we can solve it using random processes. Nobody in their right mind would do this. So very, very careful here. This was just a didactic example, right? It actually takes a couple of seconds with these 100,000 points and the estimate is bad. Using this numerical solver is a fraction of a second and you have basically the estimate. Right? So please, I, I have to emphasize, never in practice use Monte Carlo integration for these simple problems. Right? Nobody in their right mind would do that. However, there are situations where these things do have their merit. Right? And uh, in particular, in very high dimensional data spaces, quite often we are faced with the problem of having to integrate in high dimensional spaces. There, the numerical solvers typically break down. This is something they cannot really do in a sense because they have to systematically evaluate this high dimensional space to compute the integral. And this becomes very cumbersome. For those of you who've been with me in the pattern recognition lecture, remember the curse of dimensionality. So in high dimensional spaces, stuff like Monte Carlo integration is indeed very, very useful, in particular if you consider furthermore that the example we considered was stupid. Right? We you know, just used uh, uh, uniform sampling, which is typically too naive in practice. So there are other methods of how to generate these random points and, uh, for, for evaluation. Right? Uh, called, say, stratified sampling, important sampling, or Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. We may come back to the letter. So, the example was just an example, right? Now, that we have seen the idea of Monte Carlo methods, we can dive into the idea of Monte Carlo tree search. And that is, uh, in a nutshell, the idea of exploring a search tree or a state space, I use these terms interchangeably, using Monte Carlo methods. The idea is surprisingly recent. This, if you think of it, is really uh, astonishing. It was first published uh, in 1990 um, in the IEEE Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence, and uh, indeed, Already in, in 93, a guy called Brutmann, so Bramson was sort of the first who proposed it as an approach to tree search, and then again independently, Brutmann is a physicist from the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich, uh, came up with uh, basically Monte Carlo tree search to approach the problem of computer go. So this was in the early 90s, and people totally ignored this. Nobody cared about this. For decades to come. And then, and this, we're talking 2006 now, so basically just yesterday, if you wish, 
guy called Coulomb published this in the uh, Proceedings of the International Conference on Computers and Games, Efficient, Selective, and Backup Operators in Monte Carlo Tree Search. Ever since, so just ever since 2006, people who are doing research in game AI uh, have caught on. So this is, is really, I mean, it's basically a fresh idea anyway, but its popularity is even fresher. Yeah, it's all the rage in game AI these days. I don't know, like depending on, on what journal or conference uh, proceedings you read, like every second paper is about Monte Carlo research. Yeah. Is it because the probability comes with this, the last one? Because the users are trying to understand the physics behind that, or no. <laughs> so his question is how how is it possible that it sort of took uh, more than 20, 20, uh, 10 years for it to, to become really popular. Is it because people do not understand the physics behind that? I have to be careful now because we are on film. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but maybe, <laughs> maybe. You, you know my stand on this, so uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. It took a surprisingly long time for people to appreciate these ideas and it took a surprisingly long time for these ideas to pop up. Let's see, it is very, very popular these days and um, for instance, in the context of master thesis in the game AI uh, domain, that would be something to look into. Now, and here's the algorithm. <laughs> this is what Monte Carlo Tree Search does. Uh, it initializes a tree with the root node, say the initial state, empty board, or I don't know, uh, starting point of travel that has to be planned. So we have some initial state and not. And we create a tree that contains only this initial tree, load, only this. This is a very simple tree. It has no successors whatsoever. And then for capital T times, we call a function called treeBalk. Um, and we pass as the arguments the tree as the starting node, the initial node, the root node of the tree. And once that thing is done, and like, so we, we have an iteration t times something, after these t iterations we have a tree. We don't see that yet, but there will be a tree with more than one root node. Uh, with, with, there's more than the, the uh, root node, it's like more nodes, it's still just one root node, but more nodes. So once uh, this for loop is done, there will be a tree. Once we have that tree, we can move to the successive state of the highest reward. Right? And therefore, this is the algorithm for Monte Carlo tree search. But of course, without looking into the function of tree walk, we don't really understand it. So let's look into that. Here is the function tree walk. Um, when called, the first argument is the tree that has been built so far. So at the initial call, it's just the root node. And the second argument is a node. Uh, typically, it's the root node. We check if this node is uh, in the fringe or not. And again, fringe is the set of nodes in our search tree we need to examine further. Right? Should the node we pass as an argument not be in the fringe, then it has been fully explored already. All its possible successes have been generated. And so therefore, we would then select a successor, somehow randomly, we'll come back to that later, and call this function tree walk iteratively with this successor node. And we will look into an example in a second, so don't worry, this will become clear. Now, in the case the node we are currently exploring with this function tree walk, the n passed as an argument, is still a fringe node, we would expand it. That is, this node n will encode a state, say a game state, where there are maybe some of the successors have already been 
explored, but some of them not. So it will be a game state where we have not yet looked into every possible successor state. So we will then randomly expand a new successor state and add it to the tree. So this is where the tree grows. And then we will call another function called random walk tree, which starts with this newly created node. Both these functions, tree walk and random walk, return a reward value. And once we return from these recursions, like once we reach this point in this recursive function here, we just set the reward value of the node n with which we originally entered this function to the old reward increased by this newly returned reward. All right. And I'll show you an example in a second, but this is basically what Monte Carlo tree says. We have t iterations, capital T iterations, of this function tree walk. It starts with a very simple tree, just a root node. And in this tree walk, there are two regimes. One is um, how to deal with nodes that have already been expanded. And one is how to deal with nodes that have not been expanded yet. If we start this for the first time, so just with the root node, it has not been expanded yet. Right? So we will have to randomly generate a successor and add that to the tree. So the tree now contains two nodes. And from there we have to run and walk down to the leaf level of the tree. But let's look at an example. First, here is um, again the notion of a fringe. A node that has been fully expanded and is not a terminal state is not in the fringe. Everything else, nodes that are not fully expanded yet and nodes that are terminal states are fringe nodes. All right. um, once again, this is the function tree walk, which has to be called recursively. And it sometimes calls this function random walk, which is there. This is basically once you have reached the fringe. From there, you just randomly go down to some leaf level. Right? And whatever utility value you find there, you pass it back up. Let's look at the example. So, um, because of the lighting, we indeed have problems uh, seeing the whole tree, which is great, because <laughs> we don't know the tree, right? Remember that in all these examples I'm showing you, there is the tree just for you to see what happens. But in practice, we do not know the tree. Right? Here I'm just uncovering nodes so that you can see what happens. But it's not there, and because it's so bright today, we hardly see it. So, at time t equals 1, we start Monte Carlo tree search with the root node only. Right? The root node, at this point in time, is a fringe node. It has not been expanded. So, we randomly expand it. In this example, there are three successor states. We sort of randomly, and we'll talk about how later, select one of them. And this new successor state will be added to the tree. At the same time, it is still a fringe node. So we now randomly walk down the tree until we hit the leaf level. In this case, this is actually a leaf. Right, so there are two regimes. One is the red one, walking until we hit the fringe. And the, the green regime is this random walk. Once again, we have the tree walk, which basically walks down the tree we have built so far until we hit the fringe. And once we hit the fringe, randomness, like pure randomness takes over. And we walk, continue walking down the tree, like creating nodes, until we hit a leaf node, which we can evaluate and we can pass back that information. But the nodes that are being explored in that phase are not added to the tree. Only the red nodes are being added to the tree. This is a purely random exploration of things that are to follow. This is at the first point in time. Now, at the second point in time, uh, the tree contains two nodes and not an N1. This one has been generated previously. 
we call the function tree walk, now t is equal to, equal to two, we call it again with the root node. The root node is instant, is still a fringe node. It had not been fully expanded. So we sort of randomly select a node for expansion. In this case, it is N2. And we add N2 to the tree. N2 is also a fringe node. So from there, we start a random walk down until we have, we reach the leaf level of the tree. In this case, luckily, this walk is much deeper than it was here. But this is, you know, we don't know the tree, so a walk can, can be short, can be long, it depends on the deepest level. Uh, we find a reward and we can pass that back up and register it with the root node. Right? With every node we encounter uh, that has been uh, created so far. Here is what happens in the third iteration. Well, now it expands. Uh, so these three nodes are already in the tree. Now it expands this one, uh, goes down to the leaf level, finds a reward of minus one, pass it back up. And we add that minus one to the one we have found so far for the root node. And that is to say, now the root node evaluates to naught. But also note that the root node is not a fringe node anymore. All right? Because at, after the third iteration in this example, we have expanded all possible successors. And so therefore, now we are basically in this regime here. Like now, if we would call this function again, the root node is not in the fringe anymore. And so therefore, at the third, uh, fourth iteration of the algorithm, we randomly walk down like the tree until we hit the fringe. Once we hit the fringe, we expand the fringe node. And from there, we go down to the leaf level, which is again very high up in this example. Right? And we do this a fifth time randomly walk down until we hit the fringe, extend the fringe, walk down to the leaf level, find some reward value, pass it back up. Now in this iteration, and not already has a value of plus two, whatever. We do it a sixth time. Uh, this time, this, this part of the tree is being explored. Uh, seven time, this is, you know, always the same. And now I'm skipping, hopefully, no, no, wait, okay. So eight time, nine time. You see the tree, at least the fringe is growing. Right, because in every iteration, we uncover another fringe node. And now I'm skipping a couple of steps. And this is how it looks after the 12th iteration, after the 13th iteration, after the 14th iteration. Here, it happened that the algorithm went down until the fringe was reached and the fringe was a terminal, or the, the fringe node was a terminal node, so they're still covered, covered in red. Um, but there again, it, it reached a fringe node from which there was no walk down to the leaf level yet. So yeah, there you have it in iteration 14. This is how it looks after 25 iterations. And the interesting thing is not so much sort of the number of nodes that has been explored, but the reward values that have been assigned to nodes very high up in the tree. Right. Because by this two step or two phase algorithm, we start with the root node, go down to the fringe, and from there randomly go down to the leaves, find some utility, and pass that back up, and sort of register it with the utilities we have found so far. We can update the evaluations of these successor states of the root node. Right. This is not min-max. This is not min-max. If we were to do that infinitely many times, it would become min-max. Uh, but still, using this random exploration of the search tree or the state space, we come up with evaluations of the successor states of the root node, and this is what we actually want. We want to know where to move next. Can, can you read the numbers? Where would we move next in this example? And three, exactly. Right? Because after 25 random explorations of this tree, this algorithm has established that apparently on average, the payoff for this branch is higher than the payoffs for the other branches. The average payoff. Right? And therefore, 
Um, if this was, was a uh, zero-sum game, say, the player, Max, as we always call him, who is to move, given the situation we are in, in the root node, would go for the state here. And again, this, this thing is basically the complexity of this is just the complexity of reaching the leaf level. Right? Because you basically this, this uh, tree walk and random walk, they are neither depth nor breadth first, they just go down to the leaf level. Sort of randomly select nodes, like I'm here, go there, go there, go there, go there, whatever, until you hit the leaf level. That's all of them. However, this has to be done a lot of times. Right? So it may look very cheap, Unfortunately, in practice, it is not. It is not. Uh, this is nothing where we would say, okay, everything is solved. We now know how to do tree search. The number of total iterations, capital T, has to be sufficiently large in order for the statistics to work. Right? If the state space is very large, uh, you have to probe it many, 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 many times in order to fathom its structure. This is the same when there is a, um, an opinion poll out on the street. Right? So the um, polling institute has a questionnaire and they want to know people's opinion on, on politics, whatever. Uh, they may go out on the street and ask 10 people in a country such as Germany that, you know, is, is a valid sample, but probably 10 people is not really uh, a very representative sample of the whole population of the country. So you could ask 100 people, uh, or you could ask 1,000 people, or maybe a million people. And the larger your sample is, the more you can rest assured that sort of the answers you get are more and more representative, because you cover more and more aspects of the structure of the population as a whole. Right? So again, in order to fathom the structures of your search or state space, and if it is large, you have to do this a lot of times. A lot of times. However, um, I said you have to expand, uh, or select nodes for expansion randomly and did not actually tell you how to do that. We'll look into that in a second. And this is not trivial. Like, you know, when we are in the phase where we go down the tree until we hit the fringe, we have to decide for what branch to go down until we hit the fringe. And once we have hit the fringe, we have to decide for what node to randomly expand until we hit the leaf level. I said randomly, yes, that's true, but this is usually not trivial. We'll look into it in a minute. But note that it is independent of the game mechanics. There is no evaluation function here. There's no, no human ingenuity that would re be required in order to come up with uh, a selection of the next node. This is basically, we'll see, done on the rewards we have uncovered on the leaf level, which we can compute once we have reached the leaf level without knowing a lot about the details of the game. If you remember last time we talked about an evaluation function called tic-tac-toe or the time before that, and we counted lines of uh, possible wins for the one uh, player and lines of possible wins for the other. This is of course because we, as human computer scientists, interested in implementing games of tic-tac-toe know that tic-tac-toe is all about lines that have to be like three in a line, three crosses in a line, three knots in a line, whatever. We know that. We could build that into the evaluation function. If we would not know that, we could probably still evaluate the outcome of a game. Like one gamer would say, yay, I won, and the other say, well, I lost. We could count that as plus or minus one without having to know what the game was all about. We can evaluate the leaf nodes without knowing a lot about the game again. We can just decide this was a win or a loss. We can pass a minus one, plus one, or a draw zero back up the tree. And on the higher levels of the tree, these rewards accumulate. And they create statistics. 
And these statistics suggest where to move next. And this is independent of particular game mechanics. Again, yeah, I you know, said they allow, like this algorithm allows for exploring the game tree or the state space without knowing a lot about the underlying game mechanics and rules. And it is O of M. It, it takes a long time until you have determined like enough statistical information for, for making a move. But it is still O of M and not some exponential function of M or deepest level, like in shallowest level of the tree where you find solution. And interestingly, because I, it takes a long time still to evaluate trees, but as of today, these random explorations are the only algorithms that stand a chance against professional Go players. Indeed, there has been a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, again, with many, many more details than the ones I'm showing you here, that has won against the second down Go player, which is an incredible achievement because up until a few years ago, it was thought to be impossible to beat people in Go. And now there is at least an auspicious approach. And there is a lot of opportunities for research here because these things are still in their infancy still not fully understood or um, we are in dire need of ways of accelerating these Monte Carlo tree search algorithms. All right, now we have to address like the final topic of today's lecture and this will be brutal and I have to walk you extremely quickly through this but we have to look into it in order to understand, let me go back, uh, the non-trivial selection of successor nodes and that is basically to say, oh, no, I'm sorry about this, we have to think about this random selection here. So we, we are calling the function tree walk, we are dealing with a node, the one we you know, initially passed, say the root node, and say it has been fully expanded already, so it is not in the fringe anymore. And therefore, yeah, let's, let's look at an example. Here, for instance, so, so we call the function and we have fully expanded a certain portion of the tree already. So where should we consider or continue to explore next? Well, this, this is basically, should I continue sort of exploring this subtree or should we explore this subtree? If we start with this situation, this part of the tree has already been like fully expanded. Uh, where to continue our random exploration. And I said we randomly select nodes until we hit the fringe and now I have to sort of put that into perspective because we shouldn't really do that randomly. Mm, just as a side note, in computing this example, I did. I just randomly picked any node, but in practice you should not do this and in practice you are facing the following problem. Let us assume you were in a casino in Vegas and uh, playing the slot machines and of course you're interested in winning money or at least in minimizing your loss. Now you have played a couple of slot machines already and you are facing the following crucial decision. With my next coin or piece of money should I continue playing the slot machine that was most favorable to me so far Right, like you have been playing for some while and one of the machines actually eventually returned money to you and the others didn't. Should you continue with the most favorable one so far or should you check if there are other machines in the line and there usually are many. Uh, you haven't played so far but that might be even more favorable to you. That is your problem. To exploit or to explore? That is the question. What to do? And this is a very, very crucial problem, and it's called a dilemma in not just gambling, <laughs> but indeed in many areas of machine learning and optimization. And we will come back to that. But in our context, we can easily frame that as I uh, can see where this terminology of the so-called multi-arm bandit comes from. 
This multi-arm bandit problem is faced by an agent that can be you or me or a non-player character or the computer player who is you know, an implementation of a Go player. Some agent who tries to acquire new knowledge and at the same time to maximize payoff based on prior knowledge. So you want to have it both. You want to have the cake and eat it. Usually you cannot, but here you want to. Should you continue with the slot machine that was most favorable so far? Or maybe is there any other slot machine out there that is even better? How do you select where to you know, put your money? And just to make it uh, clear again, like this problem of selecting successor states during Monte Carlo tree search is exactly this multi arm bandit problem. Right? So far, we have explored certain parts of the tree and say one branch is very favorable to us already. But maybe there are other parts of the tree that are even better. We just have not stumbled across them yet. Should we continue strengthening our statistics for the branch of the tree that was very good to us? Or should we take sort of the gamble and explore uh, a less explored branch of the tree or one that has not been explored at all so far? Right. We are facing, in Monte Carlo Tree Search, when expanding this tree, we are facing the exploration exploitation dilemma or a multi-armed bandit problem. Now, uh, this is where it becomes brutal, uh, but I have to do it. Let us formalize this multi-armed bandit problem. Uh, K denotes the number of bandits. And I'm not talking about trees here, but just of, you know, bandits in a casino. Uh, K denotes the number of slot machines we are dealing with. And we have a set of reward distributions, like similar to these distributions we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture when we looked at the Bible distributions, we have probability distributions now, right? And we have K of them for every machine. For every machine, we also are able to uh, determine the average payoff. Uh, this is basically for machine I. Uh, mu I is, is the expectation, expectation of the payoff function Ri. And mu star is the overall maximum expected payoff. So say one machine has a payoff of minus 20 because you keep losing. Another machine has a payoff of two because you, know, you put in $18 and, and you know, whatever, got back $16, so you sort of uh, $20, so you, you earned $2. And another machine may actually have you know, paid you much more than you put into it. So that machine, uh, the expected payoff of that machine would then be the overall maximum payoff. Right? And we call that overall maximum payoff mu star. And this defines the so-called regret after having played T rounds. Uh, this is the Greek letter rho for regret and it is defined as T, the number of rounds we have played times the maximum payoff, average maximum payoff, so this is like sort of the best thing we could expect. Uh, this is t times mu star is the best. If everything goes really, really well, then in every round we would have played, we would have selected the machine with the best payoff, and so our average payoff would have been like the max, the best thing we could have achieved so far. Typically, things do not go so well, and so uh, instead of achieving this max, we basically sometimes we lose money, right? So from this hypothetical value, which is in practice you will never reach that, but this is the best we can expect. But we have to subtract our losses from that. Right? And this is our regret. This is called the regret. And basically this r hat t is the reward or payoff at time t. Here we do not know from which machine it came from. We just call it T because in round T, this was our payoff. Uh, we have played capital T rounds so far. Now, of course, this becomes a mathematical optimization problem. 
we basically have to come up with a strategy, an algorithm, a uh, way of minimizing this regret function. Right? And uh, I'm just mentioning it. Uh, we have to find a zero regret strategy where this rate of rho over t approaches zero as t approaches infinity. So this rho should not grow too much. That is basically, we want to have something where the regret is small. And to do so, we have to look at indicator functions again. Right. So again, I'm calling it capital H. And now the two arguments are r hat at time t, that is the payoff we actually got in the round t we have been playing. And the other argument is i that indicates the slot machines we are playing. And this indicator function, r, h of r hat t comma i, returns the reward r hat t if it was produced by bandit i. And it returns a zero otherwise. And this is similar to what we looked at when we did Monte Carlo integration. This is a filter that basically tells us like if we would fix the second argument, we have k bandits, one, two, three, up to k. If we fix some i in the range between one and k, we would or could use this function to compute the reward function and the reward values returned by bandit i. But this is what this does. Now, we can use these indicator functions to rewrite this part of the regret function. Now, if we sum the indicator function as defined here over t equals 1 up to t and fix some i, then um, yeah, it will return all the rewards from the first to the capital T round obtained with bandit i. This, of course, will be a number less than the reward, or like a different number than the reward we have had so far, because not all the rewards were produced by bandit i. So therefore we have to put another sum in front of it to sum over all bandits. Can you see this? That this here is indeed the same as that. This is crucial. It will haunt us, it will come back many a time in the next couple of lectures. Once again, here we have a sum ranging from lowercase t equals i up to uppercase t over the rewards we obtained at time lowercase t. And we have played uppercase t rounds. Now I have introduced an indicator function, and let's ignore this here. It's basically the same sum here, lowercase t ranging from one up to uppercase t over these indicator values. However, this indicator value will set everything to zero that has not been produced by bandit i. So this sum here, even though it has the same range, will be less than this. But if we sum over all the bandits, then this is the same again. All right. Why are we doing this? Because it allows us to do algebra. And I want to point out that these expected rewards, of course, implicitly depend on the number of rounds we have played so far. Right? Um, if we introduce a variable, say, ni of t, which counts the number of times in our playing in the casino, we have chosen bandit i. Right? We have played capital T games and, say, for 20 out of these capital T games, we have chosen bandit i. Then ni of t would be 20. Say capital T is 1,000 games. You have played 1,000 games, and 20 of those were played with bandit i. Now the next game, you play with another bandit. Now you have ni of 1,001, and it's still 20, because even though you have played another game, the number of times you have played with bandit i is still 20. Once you choose i the next time, this number will increase, but the capital T can be larger by that. So this is the number of times 
you have chosen bended I up to time capital T. And obviously, we can express the uh, expected uh, reward for bended I as the number of times we have chosen bended I times the reward, uh, 1 over the number of times we have chosen bended I, times the reward produced by that bandit. And this overall reward produced by the bandit can be expressed like this using the indicator function. Okay? But with this equation, we can solve for this sum here. We multiply both sides with an i of t. Right? So if I multiply this value on both sides of the equation, we get n i of t times mu i of t, and that would equal the sum. And so therefore, in this expression that appears in the regret, we can replace this somewhat brutal thing with numbers and expectations. Can you see that? And I'll come back to that next time, but think about this. This is the power of indicator functions. It's one of the beautiful aspects of indicator functions. We can use them to define averages, means, expected values. Now, the question is, and we still haven't looked into it, we want to minimize the regret. How do we do this? What kind of policies are there to select the next bandit? Should we exploit or explore? We don't know what are strategies. There are many. For instance, the so-called epsilon greedy selection works on the basis that at time t we look at the bandits and rank them according to the expected reward they have produced so far and with probability 1 minus epsilon, epsilon is something small, not too small but not too large either, we choose the bandit that has produced the best result for us so far. Right, so we first have to produce a random number and uh, if that random number is, say, larger than some epsilon, we go for the bandit that was best for us so far. If that number is less or equal than epsilon, we go for some arbitrary, randomly chosen new bandit. Then we play the bandit, we look at the reward we achieve and update these two parameters, mu i and, and n i. And of course we need to update them because our selection, or the next round, depends on the updated parameters. Uh, this is a very naive strategy. It works well, but there are better ones. Uh, this one is called upper confidence bound selection. <laughs> and I'm not, not going into the mathematical details here. This is, this is beyond what we can do in a master's level, I guess. Um, but here is a, an algorithm for selecting the next uh, bandit. We basically go for the arcmax over the set of... Uh, these expressions here, um, we select a bandit according to this decision function, play the round, update our estimate of the expected uh, reward for that bandit and update the number of times we have played that bandit, and then uh, rank the bandits again and you know, choose the maximum one again. Um, yeah, let's, let's keep it at that because, once again, the problem of selecting nodes in Monte Carlo of tree search is a multi arm bandit problem. And um, there are strategies for selecting the next bandit. And so these strategies should be used in Monte Carlo tree search. Right? In the example I have showed you, because it's such a silly, simple tree, I did not really care. But in practice, you are facing this exploration exploitation dilemma and you have to think about what to do, how to you know, use the information you have gathered, gathered so far smartly to select which branch to explore further. We just saw two strategies for that. You should use them in Monte Carlo tree search. This is, uh, the multi arm bandit problem is a long-standing research problem. It has a venerable history, it also goes back to the war um, it is of extreme importance in machine learning and decision making. And uh, 
there are numerous and very, very deep theoretical results by now on the problem of selecting strategies for multi-armed bandit settings. But um, yeah, we are not going to, to dig into these. This is, this is a bit beyond what we should do in a game AI lecture. Anyway, now you know um, about how tree search can or maybe should be done in the year 2014. Right. What have we learned today? I cannot stress the importance of having looked into indicator functions. That will come back. That will come back. Now you know what this is. Now you know how they can be used. Um, more generally, we have uh, studied, well, at least looked at to an example of uh, Monte Carlo methods. Uh, sort of understood what they are used for. And in particular, we have seen how we can use Monte Carlo methods in integration. But I have to emphasize again, for simple integration problems, you shouldn't do it. However, in very high dimensions, these things make incredible lots of sense. Then, and this is our main topic for today, we looked ever so coarsely into the idea of Monte Carlo tree search. And now you have seen it. You know the gist of it. There is a lot to be done in this area, and there's like definitely the potential for masterpieces there. Uh, yeah, and very importantly, we also looked into the notion of the exploration exploitation dilemma and saw at least two strategies, upper confidence bound selection and epsilon greedy selection, as to how to deal with it. And there are many, many, many more with provable mathematical properties, but I'll gladly ignore them all. And next time we uh, have a last look at tree search algorithms where we look at um, yeah, uh, informed tree search algorithms. So that's all for today. Are there any questions? Nothing? Great. Okay, so then we see you again on Thursday. Thank you.